So if I talk about this, will you stop asking? Fine. Watchmen prequels. Pointless, dopey idea. Okay? Satisfied? No? Ah, fine. Comics! Yar! Weird! So, a couple weeks back, DC Comics announced they were finally going to pull the trigger and publish a set of prequels to Alan Moore's Watchmen, setting off the predictable onslaught of negative outcry from comic fans, most of whom are still probably going to buy them anyway, and an equally predictable sarcastic dismissal from Alan Moore. Me, I can't really get worked up either way. Yes, the idea is stupid on its face, and I'm obviously inclined to sign with a creator over a corporation in the broad strokes, but it's kind of hard to dive into the whole no-one-should-touch-these-characters-but-Alan-Moore thing, given that reworking other people's characters defines so much of Mr. Moore's own work. I mean, even Watchmen itself started out as a revisionist book. Yeah, people tend to forget that, but Moore originally didn't conjure Watchmen out of thin air. Originally, he pitched it to DC as a miniseries featuring a set of characters that the company had recently acquired from their defunct competitor, Charlton Comics, namely The Blue Beetle, The Question, Peacemaker, Captain Atom, Peter Cannon, Thunderbolt, and Nightshade. DC loved the pitch, but were already planning to integrate the Charlton characters into the continuity of the mainstream DC universe, so Moore and artist David Gibbon redesigned the characters even further and gave them new names. Blue Beetle became Night Owl, Question became Rorschach, Shack, Peacemaker became Comedian, Captain Atom became Dr. Manhattan, Peter Cannon became Ozymandias, and Nightshade became Silk Spectre. So, yeah, can't really muster up the old moral outrage on this one. Yes, it sucks that it's all just another way for DC to keep Moore from getting his rights to the characters back, and it really sucks that they allegedly pitched the prequels to Moore himself with an offer to let him have the rights back if he'd endorse them, but that's the same contract law BS that's been screwing comic creators since Siegel and Schuster. Everything old is new again, and if you're not going to read stuff published by corporations who've screwed writers and artists in their employ, you're not going to be reading much of anything, period. Oh, hey, while we're here, there's something else I've wanted to go on record about vis-a-vis -vis Watchmen, and I might as well do it now, right? So, I get the sense that I liked the Watchmen movie probably more than most people did, but from what I can gather, it has a decent enough reputation of its own now, despite the so-so box office take initially. Anyway, I reviewed it back when it came out, but I don't think I ever really fully weighed in on the big issue, i.e. the fact that they changed a major detail about the ending. I won't spoil either one just in case, but having thought about it for a few years, I think I honestly like the movie's version a little better. Now, don't get me wrong, the book overall is better than the movie, and I appreciate how the big something in Alan Moore's version version works as the ultimate extension of the book's Silver Age weirdness as nightmare fuel aesthetic, it's just that I think the way the film version ties everything back directly to the main characters and their evolving sense of their effect on the world is ever so slightly more involving. If you have to make a change to source material, a change that actually directs the plot to be more introspective and personal to its characters is the best solution you can usually hope for. Okay, glad I got that off my chest. Now, back to our show. Speaking of writers and artists, what really annoys me about this is that these prequels aren't just a waste of our time, it's a waste of the people doing the work's much more valuable time. The lineup on these books is a who's who of some of the best talent in DC's Rolodex. Brian Azzarello, J. Michael Straczynski, Amanda Connor, Darwin Cook, Adam Hughes, Len Wein. These are people I'd much rather see spending their time on new ideas, or, failing that, since we are talking about DC Comics here, new versions of old ideas that won't be instantly overshadowed by the original. The whole thing just highlights what a problematic rut the whole industry is in. Part of the reason why the number of reliable, marketable characters and stories that DC and Marvel and whoever else can leverage into movies or TV or merchandise or whatever else pretty much ends in the mid-1980s is that creators like Alan Moore started asserting themselves during rights issue cluster like what happened with Watchmen. So these days, publishers increasingly don't get to just keep everything creators come up with as part of their permanent continuity backlog. That's been a good thing for creators, but it also means that the respective universes of Marvel, DC, etc., have been repeating themselves for the better part of three decades now. Which, ironically enough, is probably the biggest reason why DC thinks it would be a good idea to try making more Watchmen, and why so many fans, despite often stated reservations, will probably end up buying and reading more Watchmen. After almost 30 years, nothing has really stepped up to take Watchmen's place. Oh, there have been plenty of attempts. Kurt Busiek's Marvels was probably the best attempt anyone is going to make at doing a Watchmen built around publishers' authentic characters and continuity, and the Mark Wide Alex Ross Project Kingdom Come is frequently referred to as the rebuttal to Watchmen, but none of those have made the same kind of impact or had the same lasting effect. Watchmen didn't just break the mold in the comics industry, it broke the mechanism by which it did the breaking in the first place, to the point that even DC seems to have finally conceded that there'll never be another one, so now they're just down to making the same thing over again. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture.